And I took this picture before I, I saw the poster. It kind of goes together with the theme. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me at, at the Long Island History Conf Natural History Conference. Um, also, thank you for not running away when we started talking about plants. Everybody that has stayed, that's, that's great that uh, we have had people stick around for that. Um, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me and also for, after inviting me, and I actually submitted an abstract and a title, not returning it right back at me and say, please, run, get out of here. Don't, don't send this. You're crazy. Um, because I'm including not only a plant here, a local plant, but I'm also including local microbes. And I think this has to do with, the, with more and more uh, acknowledging that organisms like you and I and all the organisms that we've been talking about today are not by themselves. Right? We all are in interactions with our microbiomes, these complex, very diverse microbial communities that are in our guts, in our skins, in uh, all over our, our cells as organisms. Are they're, they're an important part of our biology and an important part of our health. And the same applies to some of the organisms that we've talking about today, and that includes uh, plants as well. And if, uh, you're, if you're on Twitter or if you're on Instagram, you can follow us. That's down there. And this is a slide that usually is at the end that I always rush through. So I'm going to take my time and thank the people that have done the work, because this is not about me. This is also about these guys that are uh, my research lab, in particular, uh, Tyler Normal and uh, Bobby Wanis, who uh, did some of the work that you'll be seeing, and uh, Sherry Saslow, who is all over the place in this project because she was part of this uh, project since its inception. Um, also, we want to thank some new friends. So I'm a recent transplant to uh, the area. That's a, a, an intended, a pun intended, uh, in, refer, in, in relation to plants. Not the last one that I will make today. Um, but we want to thank some, some of our new friends, uh, particularly in Fire Island, National Park, where we've been doing a lot of the work. Uh, Jordan, Raphael, and Kelsey Taylor. Kelsey's somewhere in the audience, and she's presenting like three or 12 posters back there, uh, if you didn't count. Um, one of them is actually on Beechcraft, so please do check it out if you haven't uh, seen it. And um, also the towns of Oyster Bay, Babylon, and uh, Long Beach, and the villages of South Terre, who have all been gracious enough to give us access to sample um, a lot of these locations and get a better understanding of what it is that we're looking at. All right, so I think I think everybody and uh, Greg Pollack also from the Hofstra scanning electron microscopy facility. Some of the cool microscopic pictures that you'll be seeing today were prepared by us, and but the pictures were taken by him. So we'll see those later. So this is what the organism that I'll be talking about today, but not only this organism, but also the, the microbes that are associated with it. Um, like I said, I'm a recent transplant and part of the the process of uh, setting roots in the area, I told you that we're going to be more puns, um, has been not getting, coming to terms with traffic in Long Island, of course, but also getting to appreciate the insane natural diversity and beauty that is in this place. And part of something that I do with my family all the time is go to the beach and enjoy the, the shoreline. And uh, the moment I got there, I started paying more attention to my surroundings and to the vegetation and started wondering, hey, this plant has been here. I've, I've lived in Massachusetts. I've lived in North Carolina. It's been everywhere where I've lived, but I've never really paid attention to it and started asking more questions about it. So in case you didn't know, the American beach grass that is here in Long Island is uh, Mophila berbi lugulata. It is uh, a, the name, the genus name is for grasses that love sand, or that's, that's where the name comes, amo for sand and fila for love. And it starts very small when the, the shoots start, it's something like this. But when, uh, by the end of the season, it can grow up two, three feet tall. And you'll see this, in mid, late summer, you'll see these seeds starting to appear, which maybe you have seen if you've been to any beaches in the past, uh, in the late summer. Um, and it is considered across the board, all over, it's spread out all throughout the Atlantic, uh, north, particularly in the Northeast, the Atlantic coast, but also through the Great Lakes, also in the, on the West Coast, although on the West Coast is a competitor to their native uh, Amophila, it's Amophila arenaria over there. Uh, so if you're from the West Coast and you know about this, 
uh, this, is, this is ours, that's theirs. And um, we can talk about the, the, how Ammophila brugula is considered a, an invasive species over there, but that's a completely separate conversation. Um, there, these, all these Ammophila grasses have a variety of interesting adaptations that allow them to colonize and to be the key uh, dune architects that, that, that they are. So they're the first colonizer of um, a lot of these dunes, and they, because of their, their root structures and also their ability to trap sand uh, through the leaves and slow wind down through the leaves, they are able to trap a lot of sand. And this is what uh, one of the roots looks like. This is uh, essentially a criminal act because I've taken a root out of the ground. And now I'm showing it to you, but we have to have an understanding of what's on there, and we have to have some way of sampling what is in that root. And it is a very distinctive root because if uh, I was to show this somewhere else in a different conference, I, I went to a microbiology conference a couple of, uh, no, no, a couple of months ago, that is almost a year ago, and I showed this picture and I was just talking in general about work that we do in the lab. We work with a couple of plant microbe interaction models and I was just showing this picture as a model of a root, but I had not mentioned at all that I was working about beach grass. And somebody in the crowd, somebody in the back said, that's Ammophila verulugulata. I'm like, wow, how do you know that? And it's, it turns out it's somebody that has been uh, working on this for a while. So it's, it's one of those very distinctive roots, and you can see how all the sand is very uh, tightly trapped in on that root. So I skipped a little bit. But it also has these very sturdy stems that allow for the, to, to withstand those uh, high winds that uh, the plant will withstand. But not only that, so not only does it have a very deep uh, root system that goes uh, pretty far down, but it also goes sideways. So it creates all these rhizomes that are start, this is a very young plant, and you can see there's a young plant here, there's a set of rhizomes that extend, uh, they're going underground here, and we can see them, we're picking it up over here, and it's also sp spreading to the side. So, oh, how did I kill that? Uh, bring it back, there we go. So we can see these rhizomes spreading to the side, and they become sturdier and stronger, and they're also the starting points for some of these shoots that you'll see sometimes in uh, beach grass in the wild. So if you see something like this in, on the beach, when you see beach grass, you'll notice that there's suspiciously, suspiciously a very straight line in there, right? And what's happening is that what those now sturdier horizontal roots and rhizomes are giving way to uh, multiple starting points for new beach grass to grow, but it's all connected. Now, what are challenges? Now, I've, picked the, the, uh, I've depicted this picture of uh, beach grass being extremely, have all these adaptations and have this ability to, to withstand all these extreme environments. It's an environment that is very devoid of nutrients, right? Um, and it's, but it's able to colonize it and to set roots very well there and so much so that it starts trapping sand and uh, is able to withstand these this very um, rough conditions of high winds, uh, high irradiation, low nutrients, and, but it still has dangers. It, has, it still has challenges that it has to face. So this is a picture taken on the boardwalk all the way to uh, the firehouse that is depicted on the poster. And as we were walking there on a family trip, all of a sudden we see some of the local fauna that are just walking around. And deer is one of the key predators of um, beach grass. So as beach grass being one of the key primary producers in uh, these dunes, you're gonna see that some herbivores are gonna show up and uh, take care of some of the beach grass populations as beach grass is trying to uh, regrow on certain areas, but also Rabbits uh, are very commonly found eating, and you can see because of the trail of rabbit pellets in areas where beach grass has been eaten. Uh, further down on the Atlantic coast, if you start going towards Virginia and North Carolina, you find out that apparently horses are also a big issue in terms of uh, con consumers of beach grass. So that's uh, one of the challenges that it faces. And then there are larger challenges. So this is one of the few pictures that I haven't taken because I haven't been to outer space yet. But this is a picture from NASA of Superstorm Sandy. And we all know how a lot of the storm overwash has destroyed uh, a lot of uh, beach grass all over the place. But the destruction could have been much worse. 
without the beach grass, without the ability that beach grass has of colonizing all these sand dunes and creating uh, these dunes. Without all that protection, a lot of these very islands would have been completely washed much, much more uh, violently than they were. So, as you probably know, there are many ways that local communities are trying to bring beach grass back. So one of the approaches to bring beach grass back is to create, uh, just create a fenced area or not allow access to any of us to get over there. And that doesn't prevent some of the predators or some of the herbivores that, uh, that come in and, and take care of the beach grass, but uh, it does take care of traffic, of human traffic. So we have this uh, in um, Cedar Beach, and we have a number of uh, re very recently uh, created dunes, and then some dunes that are a little bit older. And we'll talk about the age of those dunes in a little bit later. So but that's one approach, so not preventing any traffic from going there. And the other classic approach that you probably are familiar with this is in the beach that I go to all the time, uh, Tobe Beach, is replanting efforts. And uh, one of the replanting efforts, uh, there's actually one of these replanting efforts happening tomorrow morning. So in uh, full disclaimer, I will not be here tomorrow morning because I will be there. So I missed a couple of the talks in the morning. My apologies to uh, the speakers in the morning, but I'll be back here immediately after that. I'll be a little bit sandy, but that's the only thing. Um, so this is the other approach. These replanting efforts that happen usually in the winter, early spring, but not too much later. The problem with a lot of these replanting efforts is that they have mixed success. So in some cases, you're going to see that beach grass is going to grow very comfortably, and you could look right next to it and see that there's a whole patch or maybe a whole dune where beach grass did not take hold. And that has, of course, there's a factor in there that has to do with who was in charge of that. Was it the local Boy Scout crew that uh, we let we brought in for, for this uh, photo op, and they did it on a very winter day. It was windy and rainy, and they sort of did the job a little bit halfway through. Or does it have to do with the health of the plant, or what we're doing in terms of um, using the, sand, the, the specifics about the sand that uh, allowed the plant to, to grow? And when you look at something like this, and when I look at something like this, I'm thinking a little bit about the soil chemistry, I'm thinking a little bit about the plant itself and its ability to do what it needs to do, but then, because I am a microbiologist, I'm always thinking about, well, what's happening underneath, right? There are all these microbes that are associated with the plant that must be doing something. So the work that we do in my lab has to do with finding ways that we can learn from microbes that are in nature, take the natural diversity of microbes that is out there in terms of their metabolic capabilities, and get them to do something good for us. So some of the work that we do is also with vineyards down the street, uh, a little bit further east from here, trying to understand how agricultural practices affect those uh, microbes. So we're working with, at this point, six vineyards, and hopefully hoping to work with more. But the other half of my lab, work that I'm not gonna tell you much about today, has to do with biofuels. We look at organisms that can break down agricultural waste to make a fuel. And you can imagine that it's not just a simple conversion going from agricultural waste to fuel, otherwise we all would be driving cars full of ethanol or butanol or something like that. It has to do with more complicated conversions that require some looking, right? some hunting for these microbes, some prospecting for these microbes, but also directing that process. Now, in terms of the relationship of microbes in an environment with their plant host, a lot of the functions that we sometimes attribute to plants, they're not actually performed by the plant. They're performed by the microbes that they're associated with. So that includes nitrogen fixation, the ability of a microbe to take nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and make it into organic nitrogen. That's something that microbes do, and that microbes do in relationship with uh, in tight relationships with the plant. But there's also all these other micronutrients that microbes can make available to the plant. So they can solubilize phosphate to make it accessible to the plant to be used as a nutrient. They can sequester um, iron as well for the plant. 
they can also provide hormones, growth hormones. So they can generate um, specific um, auxins and hormones that will direct the growth of the plant, both in terms of the plant growing towards the sun and also the plant growing into their, its soil environment through the roots. And we decided to look into what those microbes might be in beach grass. So here's a picture of a beach grass root uh, under the microscope, of course. And now we are starting to see that there is this breadth of different organisms that are associated with the surface of the, of the root, but also on the inside of the root. So what we have decided to do, and we have, what we have been doing for the past uh, year and a half, almost two years, is just to start asking some basic questions about what is associated with the beach grass. Who is there in terms of bacteria that are associated with the plant? And what are they doing? Are they doing something positive? Is it a positive, neutral, or a negative interaction? And for that, we've been looking at a broad spectrum of everybody who's there, so doing this large microbial community composition analysis that tell us, using molecular methods, everybody that is there. So who are all the different uh, bacteria that are there? But also, trying to get some organisms that we can use in the lab. So get some bacterial isolates from these, um, these environmental samples. And once we have an understanding of who is there, then we can start asking some questions about does it of whether that presence or absence of specific organisms lead to some sort of change in the plant health, right? particularly with all the different examples that we have access to of successful and non-successful replantings, we can start looking at organisms that might be in one versus the other that might be an indication of what's happening in the interactions with the plant. So that leads more to what are they doing, right? What, what, is, the role, what is the role of the organisms that, that are there? So are they promoting growth? Or are they increasing nutrient availability, like some of the examples that I showed you before? Uh, are they protecting from pathogens? So there are examples of how they can do that, and multiple mechanisms of how they can do that. And we have started looking at some of those. Or are they doing the opposite, right? Are there specific organisms that are showing up in the places where uh, beach grass can grow that are beach grass pathogens? So we've been lucky to work with a couple of uh, local towns and communities and also with um, Fire Island National uh, Seashore. And we've been able to collect samples both from wild, healthy beach grass. So beach grass are growing, growing very healthily in the wild, but also replanted uh, efforts that have been successful where beach grass is growing very healthily. But also, we have also been able to obtain um, uh, samples where the replanted efforts, replanting efforts have uh, led to unhealthy growth. And you can see that this is really where we have been at. It's, we've gone from Long Beach all the way to Fire Island, but we're looking to expand. So part of the reason, my, part of my interest being here is not only learning a little bit more about Long Island natural history, but also talking to local people that have access to any of these sites to see how we can expand a little bit of our survey and get to understand a little bit more of what's happening across the whole island. But uh, we're planning on going both east and west. Uh, that's Kelsey up there. Kelsey, you're here? You're hiding? She's hiding. She's, uh, she's waving over there. Uh, Kelsey drove us all over the place on Fire Island, so we got to sample. We, and we used not only you know, terrestrial means of transportation, we also got to use uh, some aquatic means of transportation. This is the only picture, since I'm always taking pictures, this is the only picture I show up, but this is just to demonstrate that I was there doing the work as well. There's proof, there's actual visual proof I was there. Um, but a lot of the work that we've been doing, whether it's on the wild on, um, in uh, Fire Island or in uh, replanting efforts like this one right here, has been twofold. I did mention this before that we were looking at the whole community, but also at individual organisms. So we've been looking at the community level, we've been using uh, DNA sequencing, targeting a particular gene that all of these bacteria and archaea, all these microbes have. Uh, and that's the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. So this allows us to look for something that all of these organisms have and compare across the board. That can tell us all the way down to the species level who it is, but sometimes very accurately, sometimes so-so. Uh, and, but also we've been looking at these 
organisms in the root at the organismal level. So collecting specific organisms, growing them, characterizing them, and selecting which ones might be providing some sort of benefit to the plant. So I'm gonna tell you three short stories, three bits of data. I'm not gonna saturate you with too many graphs, but these are important little stories about what we have learned so far in the work that we've been doing. One of them has to do with how these organisms are structured in, at the very small scale. And when I talk about the very small scale, we're talking about microbes. We're talking about bacteria that are about a micron in size. That's a thousand, a thousand of a millimeter. Right? So in one millimeter, you can fit a thousand of those guys lined up one by one. So in a gigantic world like this one, there are actually what we call microenvironments or separations of those environments. And I've told you that we have found some organisms inside of the root, so we wanted to also get a full characterization of who is there. In that environment we call the endosphere. The soil that is adjacent to the root, so this soil depicted right here, everything that is attached to the root but is outside of the root is called the rhizosphere, and that's another particularly important environment because this is the zone of interaction with the plant. Right? This is where the microbes that might be on those uh, grains of sand are interacting with the plant because the plant is releasing root exudates. So some of the photosynthate is coming through the plant and it's being released to uh, create some interaction with the organisms that are down there, with the microbes that are down there. And also the rest of the soil. Oh, whoops. And then there is the rest of the soil, right? So every, not the soil that is immediately adjacent to the root, but the soil that is right next to the plant uh, might have a role, might have a uh, certain level of organization of what happens to the plant and what happens to the, particularly the microorganisms that are associated with the plant. And when we have looked at these, this is the, the, the dream and the nightmare of everybody that does microbial ecology like I do. So we spend an insane amount of time looking at these bar graphs and thinking and seeing patterns in the colors and in the shifts of microbial communities. But what this is representing is the proportions of different organisms, in this particular case, is at the class level, not at the phylum level. The proportion of classes, so remember, phylum is the very broader group of, uh, or the broader clade level, class is a little bit more defined, of bacteria that are present in its totality. So of all the sequences that we looked at, every single one of these represents a triplicate, so three different sets of sampling, and every single set of sampling we obtain somewhere between 50 to 80,000 sequences. Right? So a lot of data now being summarized in this atrocious graph. But we can start seeing some patterns of Depend, regardless of where we look at, so these are three locations on Fire Island. Regardless of where we look at, you can see how all of these samples of bulk soil look a lot alike in terms of community composition. And the moment we start moving into the rhizosphere and into the endosphere, we start seeing different patterns. So the root environment, kind of not surprising, but it's, it's useful to have some data that actually shows that. As we start moving into the root environment, we start seeing some specialization of the community. Right? So we start seeing some shifts, particularly in terms of these alpha bacteria that you see jumping from being in those numbers a little bit higher up, but also uh, the beta bacteria get um, a little bit reduced, which are these purple ones right here. Gamma bacteria, which are very dominant, seem to be remaining around the same, but then start becoming more reduced in the endosphere. And then there's other specific groups that are in, in smaller proportions that we see uh, where we see shifts as well. It turns out that also when we look at these comparing healthy and unhealthy uh, microenvironments, so when we're comparing, again, bulk soil, rhizosphere and endosphere from one to the other, whether it's in a healthy environment or in an unhealthy environment, there don't seem to be large shifts. We're expecting to see completely different um, community structures in the unhealthy environments. In, the, in every community that was associated with, uh, with an unhealthy replanting. Uh, these are both specific, specifically from Tobe, so we have healthy on the left, uh, where am I going? Healthy on the left and um, unhealthy on the right, and you can see how the bulk soil, again, is looking much more similar to one another, 
than uh, the, the two root environments. But these are the phylum level and these are the class level, so very broad. We still, we can detect some changes in community composition and community structure in, at this level, but we need to move in further to get some specifics of genera or species that are switching between or are changing between one and the other. So this brings me to the second bit of story or the second uh, piece of data that we have. I already pointed to those shifts between healthy and unhealthy that we're not seeing at the phylum level, we're not seeing really at the class level. But then when we start looking at other pieces of data of comparing healthy and unhealthy replantings of some of these surveys, we start seeing some other bits of information that are kind of interesting. So for example, here on the left hand side we have uh, healthy um, counts and unhealthy counts in terms of total numbers of species in each one of those samples. So remember that each of these samples we sampled about 50 to 80,000 sequences. These allowing us to detect between 2,000 and 3,500 species, different species of bacteria present in each one of these samples. This is even surprising to people that work in soil microbial ecology forever. Right? So I, I, I came from an agricultural soil microbiology background, and every time that I talk to my colleagues about these data, I say, so sand on a beach, how many different species do you think are present there? And usually our range that we're used to is, oh, I don't know, between very deprived soils and very rich soils is somewhere between 2,000 species to 8,000 species. That's a good range. People usually average it as, oh, there's five agricultural soil, 5,000 species in a gram of soil. And every single time I say, well, how much do you think you would expect to find in sand? And the answer is always the same. Well, it's got to be super deprived, right? There's got to be like 100 species. It turns out that, no, there's many more, regardless of whether we're talking about rhizosphere soil or endosphere soil. Uh, this is not endosphere soil, this is inside of the root. But rhizosphere soil or of healthy uh, plants or unhealthy plants, the numbers, the diversity here is outstanding. And I'm showing these dominant species. These are species that are found in proportions less than 0.01%. So we're talking about species that show up less than 10 counts in each one of these libraries. Um, just to make sure that there's a lot of species that show up at, that are detected by uh, the, the sequencing protocol that we're using as showing up just once. Right? But they make up, as you can see, in some cases, a big proportion of what the diversity is. But even if we're looking at full diversity or, or full number of the species, oh, let's go back, or just the species that are dominant, which are the ones in yellow, the ones that are above that threshold, we still see the same patterns when we go from the healthy to the unhealthy. And that is that between healthy and rhizosphere and endosphere, there doesn't seem to be too much of a change in terms of numbers of diversity, in terms of total numbers of species. Whereas there always seems to be a drop in diversity when we're looking at different systems between the rhizosphere and the inside of the root when we're looking at uh, replantings that have not been successful. And also when we start looking more specifically, like I promised before, at the genus level, when we start looking at the different genera that are present in, uh, in when you see difference in, in, in location, we've been trying to separate these, we've been trying to filter this, because the number of genera in uh, these samples are between 300 and 500. So pretty diverse. And I'm showing you here only the ones that have a decrease from the healthy to the unhealthy that is larger than 1% in terms of total community composition. So at the end of today, you know that there's a quiz, right, about all the different species of turtles and reptiles and amphibians and what else do we talk about? fish, and also there's a quiz about the species, the local Long Island bacteria species that we're finding. <laughs> so remember all of those right now? No. Um, I'm going to filter through all the data and tell you a couple of the conclusions that we have found from finding the, the differences. Some of the differences you saw that they have gigantic error bars, but we've been looking at the ones that are actually significant between unhealthy and healthy. And what we have found is that some particular species that end up being more abundant in the healthy soils than in the unhealthy soils 
are relevant to the environment. So for example, we have found that this Mucilaginibacter uh, species, so that's the genus, uh, but there's a number of species within the Mucilaginibacter. This is, as the name indicates, it produces uh, some sort of exopolysaccharide. And most of these organisms produce exopolysaccharide to protect the plant. It turns out that this species is across the board, across all the environments, we're finding it to be significantly more abundant in healthy versus unhealthy environments, or healthy versus unhealthy uh, replanting efforts. In the bulk soil, there's a number of uh, soil genera, common soil genera like Verruca microbium, Bacillus, and Nitrosuspira that are more abundant in, in healthy soils. And that's interesting, particularly because Nitrosuspira plays a role in nitrogen cycling, so that is a, a little bit interesting. Uh, likewise, at the rhizosphere, there's a lot of rhizobiaceae, uh, the genus Rhizobium, that play a role in nitrogen fixation. Some of those are, some of the rhizobia species are uh, strict um, nodule formers, so they have to exist inside a nodule like they do in relationships with legumes. Um, but some rhizobiaceae are free living rhizobia. So the fact that these guys are present in the rhizospheres in larger numbers and that they play a role in nitrogen fixation is kind of interesting. So the monas is also there. So the monas also plays some roles in uh, nitrate reduction. But we'll talk about that in a second because the monas is a little bit iffier to get too excited about. Um, Rodanobacter in the endosphere. Rodanobacter is a denitrifier that is uh, found in multiple root systems across the world, all over the world. So if you Google Rodanobacter, you'll find that it's being isolated from cotton, from ginseng, from uh, all kinds of plants. And it see, it's much more abundant in the healthy endospheres. On the other side, when we look at organisms that are more abundant in the unhealthy uh, um, microenvironments, we found that this Actinophytocola species, which is an Actinomyces, so these are organisms, a broad range of organisms that uh, are filamentous and that some of them produce streptomyces, uh, like streptomyces, some of them produce um, antibiotics, but some of them are pathogens and some of them are uh, great cellulose degraders, and I know this because of uh, work in, uh, in the area of biofuels. But this particular one is a species that all the organisms that have been found for this particular genus are found in desert soils. And it's found as a result associated with some sort of root, with some sort of plant in the desert. Uh, this is interesting that it just shows up everywhere in all of these, the root microenvironments that we were talking about. Uh, in the bulk soil, common soil genera such as uh, Pseudomonas and Arthrobacter are found to be more abundant on healthy soils. Does that ring a bell a little bit from the previous slide? Yes. Pseudomonas was in the previous slide as one of those organisms. Pseudomonas is a very broad genus. And this is one of those tricky pitfalls of the work that we're doing. When we're looking at some of these organisms, even though we might find that they shift in some particular level between one place and the other, some pseudomonas might be pathogenic, and some pseudomonas are known to be pathogenic, and some pseudomonas are known to be plant endophytes that promote growth and promote the health of the plant. So it's important to no, no, not make too many assumptions about the role of these organisms, and that's why where Pseudomonas plays uh, uh, a role in here. Um, similarly, in terms of the actinomycetes that we found out here, in the rhizospheres we're finding all these actinomycetes of these different genera that are, have also been found to be plant associated in, in other studies. And then in the endosphere we're finding that this uh, endophytic pathogen, phytoplasma, is uh, most prevalent in those endospheres of the unhealthy plants. So these, and this is only found in the endosphere, so it's not being found in any of the other microenvironments. So that might be something that was brought by the replanting efforts in the plants that, that were brought in. Maybe it was in the soil to begin with. Maybe it was something that got enriched by uh, the conditions of having a plant that was not successful growing. Uh, so this is very complicated long-term sort of community dynamics that we want to look at, but it's at least a first glimpse of what's happening in here, of, of some of the key organisms that we want to be looking at. And this is again that picture from Cedar Beach, in which we have started looking at, because we've only been doing this for less than two years, I kind of pretend that we've been doing this long-term time study. Maybe call me in 20 years, and then I can tell a little bit more about all the, the work that we've been doing. We're going to go on our third uh, summer of sampling this coming summer. But we've started looking at the evolution of these younger dunes compared to these older dunes that are more established. 
in terms of the macroval community composition. So we've been calling them primary, secondary, and tertiary out of uh, lack of better nomenclature. And we've been looking at the shifts in diversity in those, in those communities from primary, secondary, to tertiary. And this is where we've seen one of the biggest shifts. So you can see this is just based on total counts of reads from that 16 or some other gene, how from the primary and secondary there's a shift in the tertiary towards those actinobacteria. That was the first red flag for our data. So when we started looking at all of these data sets combined and started looking at averages of uh, shifts in community composition, we saw how between the primary and the secondary, there were very little shifts in terms of numbers of, or proportions of uh, some of the larger phyla. This is at the phylum level. But then when we look at here, there's that big shift in the tertiary in terms of actinobacteria. And that's not just one sample, that's multiple separate dunes that we're calling tertiary or mature dunes that are adjacent to the primary and the secondary. So all of these have this prevalence of these actinobacteria. And when we look at the, a, 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 the whole thing in a little bit more detail, we see that the drop in protobacteria has to do with some uh, important protobacteria, alpha and gamma protobacteria include a number of uh, what we would consider important, uh, important organisms like uh, nitrogen fixers, organisms that are helping the plant as uh, endosymbionts, but that could be, uh, there we go, uh, but that could be important at the beginning, right? At the beginning of establishment, there are some of the most dominant uh, clades at early on the establishment of, that, of those plants. And maybe later on, it's this, big this is one big shift that we see in terms of an increase. We see those actinobacteria being uh, more dominant. And when we look at it in more detail in terms of the actinobacteria, now we divide it into families. What families specifically are the ones that are increasing? We're finding that it's families that include root endophytes, uh, plant growth promoters, and some of those antibiotic producers that I told you about before. A lot of streptomycetes are showing up uh, as an increase in those long-term dunes. And that's something that we can look for. That's something that we can easily look for. So if you pay close attention to this plate, it looks like a gigantic, disgusting mess. I get it. If it brings you bad memories to college microbiology or any microbiology you might have done at some point, uh, yes, that's what that looks like. But if I draw your attention to those areas where there's atomic bonds being dropped, right there <laughs> and right there, right, you see how those guys right in the center have created these zones of clearing, obliterating any growth around them. Those are excellent candidates for actinomyces that are producing some sort of antibiotic. And they're coming, this is coming straight out of rhizosphere soil. So this is rhizosphere soil that we have put on a plate that selects for, for some of these antibiotic producers and we've been able to find some of these. So these are the sort of organisms that now at the organismal level we can start screening for. And that involves a lot of piles and piles and piles and piles and piles of plates that uh, Sherry here is pretending to have a great time with. Um, <laughs> and it ended up looking a little bit like this, and some of them are going to produce, and this is the, the part of this work that becomes a little bit tedious, because some of them are going to immediately be something that you can easily detect as, oh, that is something useful. Some of them are gonna start producing these changes in coloration in the plate, telling you that they're secreting something that might be interesting to look like, some metabolite that might be interesting to look at. And for that, we have a couple of methods to screen for this. So we look at this particular growth hormone, uh, indoleacetic acid, which comes from uh, the amino acid tryptophan. So you and I cannot make tryptophan, but bacteria and plants can make, we get uh, tryptophan as amino acid through diet, they actually can synthesize it. And some bacteria generate, can use a couple of different pathways. So these are, there's two pathways and then there's a whole variety of other pathways that are beginning to be uh, uh, developed to, or studied to convert tryptophan to this uh, compound, indo-3-acetic acid, or IAA, which is an auxin, it's a plant hormone that serves as a signal, one of those secret handshakes between bacteria and plants for um, plants to grow in a particular direction and to wrap themselves around a particular organism. And these two guys, Sherry and Bobby, have been working on characterizing a lot of these plates full of these isolates that I told you about. So we have a little bit over uh, 200 isolates that we have been screening. 27 of them produce uh, amounts that are considered to be growth-inducing amounts of uh, the plant hormones. So they're producing around 100 micrograms per mil 
of that plant hormone per in, in a culture of uh, that particular organism. Uh, most of the other isolates, so this is 27 of the 200 and something isolates that we have, most of the other isolates that produce any average around 42 uh, micrograms per mil of production in terms of uh, that plant hormone. We are very excited, of course, as you might imagine, about the organisms that are all the way up here. Uh, so we've started screening from you know, the highest to the lowest in terms of who, uh, what role they might have in terms of uh, uh, plant growth promotion. Uh, the other thing that we can look at is the ability to capture those micronutrients. So the ability to produce sidrophores. Sidrophores are compounds that can range from relatively simple to really, really complicated that microbes can make to sequester iron. And so there's a broad variety, but you can screen for those in uh, some plates that show you these halos. This is a cast acerol plate. Uh, let's go back. Cast acerol plate that allows you to see any air zone of clearing means that the microbe where it grew, has sequestered some of the iron away from the media. And this is that same, that's, this is a plate of the same top organism that we have right here, this AEW4, that our top producer also happens to be an organism that produces this there therefore. So another way of looking at these organisms. Um, okay, they produce these compounds, but what happens in relationship with the plant? We've been looking at this assay with Arabidopsis thaliana. It's not beach grass, but it's a plant that we can use in the lab and looking at the growth in planta. And we've been seeing how this is measured after four days and see how the root growth is affected by this, the presence of the organism. So we can use sterile media, we add sterile media to the plant, uh, we use media with the plant hormone and we use media that, where the organism has uh, grown and produced whatever metabolism is going to produce. But where the part where we actually see most growth, this big difference in growth between this right here and this right here, is where we have the micro present. All right, and to conclude, we have seen from some of our preliminary uh, community analysis that that microbiome associated with the, with the beach crest is structured in all these different environments. Uh, that composition tends to change depending on the material of the, the, the dune, but we're going to see over time, we're gonna try to do this as a long-term project in terms of checking how some of these dunes as they are evolving or getting bigger, how they, they uh, might change in terms of community composition and what becomes more important later on. Uh, we've been comparing healthy and unhealthy replanting efforts in terms of who is there, who's present, and we're identifying some interesting promising genera. But now with that information, we can actually go back to those samples and start developing methods for isolating specifically those organisms, right? Now we can use broader information to track down and, and pinpoint, okay, let's see now if we can find some of these pathogens or some of these um, uh, growth promoting organisms that seem to be specifically in the endosphere or specifically in the rhizosphere and see if they would have a role in uh, plant growth promotion with the assays that I was showing you before. And then uh, some of these screen isolates seem to have uh, a lot of promise in terms of promoting growth in uh, this assay that I showed you with our abdosis, but of course the implant assay that we really care about is work that we are starting on the uh, greenhouse in, at Hofstra with actual beach grass. So we wanna see now with the, the real, or the two players that we're interested in actually seeing this interaction, what is happening. And with that, uh, I wanna thank uh, everybody again that uh, I, I think before, but also we just uh, got great word that uh, NSF, the Plant Biotic Interactions Program, has funded our project for the next two years. So hopefully you'll be seeing a lot of us all over the place. If you see us sampling, if you see people that are where they shouldn't be on the dunes, that's probably us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>